Welcome. My name is Annette. I'm president of the Saratoga Historical Foundation. Before we start, I'd like you to turn off your mic and your video camera. We will be recording this presentation. So if you turn off your mic and your camera, that would be wonderful. If you have any questions, we're going to ask you to use chat, which is at the bottom of your screen. And the questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Saratoga Historical Foundation. You're all volunteer, and we're a nonprofit organization. We maintain a museum, an 1850s pioneer cottage, and a one-room schoolhouse for Saratoga. You can see it right there. We are presently closed due to COVID, but please check our website at www.saratogahistory.com and to see when we will be open. Yeah. To keep in touch, we are sponsoring these wonderful presentations on local history each month on Zoom. So coming up, we have on April 26, bringing Spain to California with uh, Paul Bernal. Uh, he is a historian as well as a judge, and he'll talk about his family's trek from Mexico to San Jose in 1775. Wow. On May 24th, we have a presentation based on the book Quest for Flight. John J. Montgomery, who grew up in Santa Clara, built and piloted a glider in 1883 in the first controlled flight, way before the Wright brothers. So... Our very talented speaker, Judith Taylor, is a graduate of Somerville College and the Oxford University Medical School. She moved to the United States in 1959 and became a board-certified neurologist. She practiced neurology in New York and then retired to San Francisco with her husband. Since retiring, she has, turned, she has written six books on horticultural history as well as numerous articles and book reviews on the same subject. Her last book is called Obstacles and Opportunities for Women Gardeners Throughout History. Her website is www.northhistorian.com. Today's presentation is based on her book, Yay! The Olive in California. So now I'd like you to hear Dr. Judith Taylor. Welcome. Thank you for that very kind introduction and thank you for inviting me to do this presentation. As you may remember, it was scheduled for a year ago and got progressively canceled time after time. So I was very happy when Joe Rainey got in touch with me again this time. I can tell it's a very vibrant and active association. This is the cover of my book. And you may ask, people have asked me, why did I subtitle it History of an Immigrant Tree? It is a very fascinating story. And we have to spend a little time uh, on the history of the olive tree, its role in civilizations, its, its movements and migrations. For it, it migrated long before I got to California around the Mediterranean Rim, and has now ended up curiously in many, many other countries. We'll come to that. And then, of course, I will say how it got from Spain to Mexico to California, and then a little bit about how it got on once it got to California. We don't have a lot of time, so naturally, I will have to stick with sort of the highlights. If I may take a couple of seconds to tell you why I chose to do this, if you'll indulge me. As uh, Annette said, my husband and I moved from, Cal from New York to Tiburon in Marin in 1994. We bought a very nice house. The garden was not so nice. And we had visited Striving Arboretum before and I had learned about the Mediterranean climate. So I said to my husband, we need to plant olive trees since we're in a Mediterranean climate. And so we did. And they just 
was so beautiful. I couldn't contain myself how, how beautiful the silvery gray leaves and all the stuff. So I went to the library in my natural response, looked for a book, find out about them. It wasn't a book. I even was ready to buy a book if there'd been a book, but there was no book. So in that situation, what do you do? You write your own book. And I have to say that in the course of gathering the information for such a book, I traveled very widely, north and south, up and down the state. I got to know Route 99 extremely well and came across people, the most wonderful people who were going about their very arduous business of either growing olive trees or turning the fruit into oil or whatever it was they were doing. That was my reward. The book is a bonus. Yes. So this picture is taken, it was probably about 1900, was a, was a postcard I found. It's not far from Sacramento, maybe somewhere near Roseville. And those little tiny green dots are juvenile olive trees. So now let's move to the next slide, please, Tom. Yes. Here is the most important part of the history in a way, it was this history in Greece. As I think I may have said, or if I haven't, I'm going to say the olive began probably two or three places. If you find clusters of a wild plant, which is subsequently cultivated, you can assume that they began where the wild plants are. But to, for the two, Tonight's purpose is, let's simply say, the Eastern Mediterranean and close to the Aegean Sea. And we're talking about six or even 8,000 years ago that there are records of human beings handling olives. They may go back beyond that, but that's where there are records. And the, this vase is very beautiful and it shows rather vividly two, three people gathering olives. If you can see, there's a tree in the middle and then a, a man and a woman and maybe a child and those sort of black dots falling and they've got staves in their hands. You beat the branches of the tree when the olives are ripe and they fall down. And if you're sensible, you put a cloth underneath them to pick them up. The olive played an enormous role in several civilizations. And so a lot of that has come down to us, but in a muted fashion. Now, what was this? Why, why are we here tonight talking about a fruit tree? We don't have meetings to talk about apple trees or pear trees very often. The olive tree has gathered an enormous aura of mystery and romance and glamour. There are a couple of biological reasons for that. It's a tree which lives a very long time. I have in the frontispiece of my book a photograph from, taken from southern France of a tree known to be 600 years old. Just outside Jerusalem at a traffic circle there is the remains of an incredibly old tree. It's said to be 2,000 years old, maybe. But what I'm getting at is it lives for a very long time. It kind of gets into its groove around 50 and it's still quite happy and busy at 100. And yet during all that time, while the rest of us, when we get to be that old, lose our teeth and dodder around, the olive tree continually putting out fruit. It is, um, it is evergreen, the leaves don't fall off. So it's always got its leaves, but they're constantly being renewed. It puts out a lot of suckers at its roots and it puts up it puts out blossom and then fruit. If you cut a piece of an olive branch and stick it in the ground, in six months you'll have an olive tree. So the ancients were very struck by this astonishing longevity and fertility. And this was in the absence of any particular care. I mean, it thrived in dry, rocky soils where nothing else much would grow except for grapevines, and that's important. So they were, they were really intrigued, and they gave it, they thought of it as having somewhat miraculous powers. In Greek mythology, the tree was supposed to result 
from Athena sticking her spear in the ground and an olive tree sprang up. All the rituals in Greek society, later in Roman society, and then in Judaism and Christianity all revolved around this tree. And we'll talk some more about that. Could we see the next slide? This is an archaeological site. The Phoenicians had a very flourishing olive oil industry and they uh, traveled around the Mediterranean exchanging it for other goods. And then you can see uh, very, very crude but effective millstones and pits to gather the oil. Next one, please. This is a recreation of a similar ancient olive oil press in the Israel Museum in, in Tel Aviv. And on Wednesdays, they actually bring a donkey who comes and, and turns the wheel around to show the visitors to the museum. Next one, please. And this is the garden at Gethsemane. And you notice there ancient trees. I mean, ancient already at the time this picture was created. You can tell by their gnarled, irregular shapes. They're not. They're not symmetrical or pretty as they get older. Should we move on now? Now, here is Mission Santa Barbara. So I've, I've covered a lot of ground. I've suddenly gone from the Garden of Gethsemane to Mission Santa Barbara. I better fill a few things in as we go along. The trees, the, the fruit of the trees gave this marvelous oil. And it took a very long time before people understood you could also eat that fruit. And we'll talk about that too but they gave this marvelous oil. And so wherever anybody went, they planted the trees to get the oil. The emigration around the Mediterranean Rim was very slow. People could only travel very short distances on foot or a little further uh, on the, by sea. But gradually the tree was taken all around as far west as Spain and up into France, the southern part of France, it got to Italy, the Romans used it a great deal. So, and Greece, of course, was a major, major place for it to spread out. It then got to Sicily. So it was established in these various cultures and the two or three major religions that were active at the time. So let us now talk about uh, Spain and its influence on all this. Spain remains the largest grower and exporter of olives and olive oil. Back in the day in 1490, when King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella took over, you know, they were very religious. The queen particularly was very religious and they, they gave um, Columbus the go ahead to travel west to see if he could find the Indies and find poor benighted people who hadn't seen the light of Christianity. So he came back about a year later with all his glowing reports and they decided that the thing to do was to set up colonies in the new world for several reasons. One was that it was good for excess people in Spain to have somewhere to go. They would in turn find all these valuable things and send them back and at the same time they could carry the light of Christianity. So they made this choice of putting the, um, the front, the, 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 um, the pioneers of this, they sent both soldiers and religious. They sent um, Franciscans, and at first it was all into Mexico, what is now Mexico City, high up in the mountains. So 1493, you have Columbus coming back. The headquarters of this operation was in Seville and they built a particular place called Casa das Indias where they collected together all the supplies colonists would need. And that included fruit, trees, small saplings, and of course seed and everything else. The people go out and they try to make things happen and it's very, very difficult. So the first date that's important in this history is 1524. Father Valencia took 12 friars with him. They called them naturally the 12 apostles. 
and they went into Mexico City and they set up a religious foundation. They built what they called a convent, we would call a monastery. And something rather adorable about this is that 200 years later, at the beginning of the 19th century, an American woman who was married to the Spanish ambassador to Mexico lived next door to that monastery. And she wrote letters home and she talks about the moonlight shining on the silver leaves of the olive trees in the convent. And just as an aside, if you haven't read uh, Fanny Barca de Calderon's Life in Mexico, you are in for an enormous treat, but I digress. So they've got into Mexico and they gradually start going south down the coast of Mexico, setting up missions. During this time, Spain had been the ruler of the new world. It shared it grudgingly with Portugal, but it primarily was the ruler. It had laid claim not just to Mexico, but also to Alta, California. That is part of the US mainland on the West Coast, which they called Alta, California. But they were preoccupied with many other things and not watching. And then suddenly somebody pointed out to them, whichever Philip was king, that the English were coming around and the Russians were coming around. So in the middle of the 18th century or 1760s, the Spanish got their act together and they put up uh, a big series of um, ships, again with priests and soldiers, and they decided to send a whole set of new colonists from the last Mexican um, mission, which was down in Baja, California. They created the port of what I call Mazatlan. I'm not good at Spanish. And in the 1760s, uh, Portola and Father Junipero Serra set off and they landed in San Diego. Now, I know that Serra and what he did is very controversial and I don't want to cause any troubles this evening. We're talking solely about him as the manager and as the uh, person who created missions, whether or not what he did with the native people was right or wrong is not for tonight's discussion. But he was the right choice because he was driven by demons, even though he had a chronic injury in his leg, which caused him a great deal of pain, nothing stopped him. And they moved up the west coast of California from San Diego up through, um, through what is now Los Angeles, got to Santa Barbara. And this is a picture of the mission as it was um, after it had been abandoned. In the interim of this story, the Mexicans had freed themselves from the Spanish yoke, declared independence in 1822. And then after a few more years, they looked at the influence of the church and the fact that the church owned enormously valuable property. They decided they disestablished the church. They drove the missionaries away. They seized the lands. The missionaries had done a fantastic job. They arrived in a strange place. They had no idea what to expect. They brought with them cattle and horses and poultry, as well as seeds and small plants of various kinds. What they had done actually was they had really raided the previous mission. The, the unfortunate people in the, that more recent mission in Baja suddenly faced ruin because Sarah simply swiped everything and ran off to San Diego. And they were given a very powerful uh, responsibility. Their principal reason for this was the cure of souls. They were to convert whatever native people they could. That was the thing that counted most back in headquarters. The fact that they had to live was somewhat secondary, but the idea that they grew a lot of cattle, they would get very valuable hides. So their living was, their finances, as it were, were dependent on cattle hides. And then of course, in order to eat, they grew pretty well everything themselves. And the reason I'm going into a little bit of detail is that we know 
Sarah landed in San Diego in 1769. And he took with him all these fruit trees and everything. And we know presumably that things were planted. There's correspondence between him and the various people above him saying what he should do next. He didn't plant the orchards right away. It took him about a year or two, but then he definitely planted them. And I think most people in the audience know it takes a very long time for an olive tree to become fruitful. In the old days, it was definitely no less than seven years, although more recently with improved uh, agricultural techniques, you can get a reasonable crop after three or four years. So we're now somewhere in the middle of the 1770s, plus or minus. But the next date I want you to bear in mind is the first time there is any formal record of the fact that they did in, ha in fact have olive trees. In 1803, 20 odd years after they, more, 35 years after they landed, the man who succeeded Sarah, Father um, Fermin Laswen, recorded in his report to his superiors that for the first time, they used oil from their own orchards, olive oil, for baptism. It was known as chrism. And built into that 1803 date is also a very long delay because I think perhaps some of you in the audience know, I had not known till I looked into this work for this book, that the olive oil must be blessed by the bishop in order to have its maximum ritual effect. So whatever oil they had grown had had to go to Mexico City where the bishop sat and come back. So there you get an idea. We do not have any specific notion because as I said earlier, the thing that the Franciscans were supposed to do, one, convert uh, native people and two, send back hides. Everything else was a really very secondary important. And as far as they were concerned, a mere olive tree was just really wallpaper. So now here's this poor old mission uh, and it's been deserted. And by the way, when you go to the missions now, if you go to Santa Barbara or San Luis Obispo or wherever, they're very beautiful. Those gardens are just lovely. But in the days when the missionaries were here doing their work, there was no such thing. Yes, they had the orchards, but they had no ornamental decorative things. That courtyard was a workshop where the uh, native people had to do all the various jobs that the missionaries assigned to them. You see the next slide. Here's poor old San Diego from the similar period. Next one, please. This is an interesting place. I haven't yet come to the specific uses they put the olive tree to, but this is in Ventura County. It was the property of the Del Valle family. And they had huge, huge orchards of citrus primary, but they grew many other crops and they grew olive trees and this, very simple, rather primitive looking structure is the very first olive oil producing machine for commercial use in California. The missionaries, when they were thrown out of their property, had to run and left everything behind. And all the work they put in to raise fruit orchards and so on was lost. But as we said from the beginning, the olive tree will survive almost no matter what. You either have to cut it down or set fire to it. So all throughout that period, as population began to increase after the gold rush, you suddenly had more than thousands and thousands of people to feed. People were using informally everything that was done, uh, everything that was growing in those olive orchards. Can we see the next slide? Here's a very well-known figure who started, you know, found a Sonoma, as over at Rancho Petaluma, he was in the Bear Flag result, Revolt. He was significant because he planted olive orchards very early in Sonoma County. He happened to live next door, the Hungarian winemaker, Arastri, and over the years, the children married each other. And there is an, indeed an ancient connection and sort of symbiosis between vines and olive trees. We'll speak more about that afterwards. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
John Bidwell was a very, very impressive figure. He was the first man who brought a party of settlers across country from, in his case, from Ohio to California through the Great Salt Desert, over the Sierra and all the terrible uh, obstacles without losing anybody. Previously, many people died en route. I mean, you have the terrible tragedy, you know, with the, um, the, the blocking, sorry, senior moment. But Bidwell came through in 1841. And even better, he found very easy to find gold on his holding. And then he settled down and he became a real country gentleman and a major figure in California life. He had grow, he was growing olive trees very early. And I think if you see me, show me the next slide. We now show you a, a mission more recently in the early part of the, of the 20th century, Mission Santa Clara with two of the, um, I think these are priests, showing olive trees growing along the dark things above the heads of the, um, of the priests there. And I have visited, that's still in existence, I have visited that site. Next slide, please. When, when people signed up to become Franciscan friars, they were many times scholars, they were involved in biblical studies and theology, they had various professions. Very, very few of them thought they were going to become farmers. Curiously, Sarah himself came from a farming family in Mallorca, and that was very valuable. He knew a great deal. But the other people who were thrust into a newly opened mission, let's say they had raided Mission San Diego, and they started to, use, to make a mission up uh, in Santa Barbara, those Franciscans were not intending to be farmers. They knew nothing at all about it. So what did they do, just as I had when I wanted something? They turned to books. And there are these two treatises which are in the Mission Library of Santa Barbara from the mid 18th century. But when you read them, this one is called Agricultura General by Herrera. The next slide, please. There's another one with the same title by a man called Deval Carcel. And you can see the date 1765 is way at the bottom in tiny print. The information in these books was age old. They were quoting from the Roman authors, Columella, the great Roman agriculturists. And when it came to the culture of olive trees, nothing had ever changed. So they knew what to do in general, at least in bookish terms. They therefore they planted their trees, you have to plant them in the dry climate, you have to plant them far apart because they have very shallow roots which re reach quite wide. And if they're too close together, they interfere with each other's use, the collection of the water. When the trees are young, they have to be watered. So the priests grew goods, which they dried and used as ladles. And they would take buckets of water out into their orchards and they would hand water all their new trees, all their new fruit trees, including the olive trees. The olive tree, once established, can do very well on its own with whatever it finds in the soil and will live interminably, as I said, with very little in the way of help. Nevertheless, if you want it to produce a useful commercial crop, it likes a little water. When I did those journeys up in the Sacramento Valley meeting with growers, they explained to me that in the summer, they arranged to irrigate those orchards maybe three or four times over a period of the summer in order to get a, an adequate crop. They would be a crop, but not one that was worth picking and selling. And by the way, that whole story of the picking, um, how, how that's all handled is a very big, very big California story. Our next one, please. We now come to a very, another very important figure. As I said, I'm touching really on highlights. Elwood Cooper actually came from um, the Caribbean. He was born in one of the islands in the Caribbean, lived in New York for many years, then went west. And he bought land 
outside Santa Barbara, what I call Coletta, but I think that the pronunciation is different. And he wanted to have um, grow fruit and, and, and you know, crops, make a living. And that started in 1868. So I don't have a, I don't think, can you show me the next slide, please? No, can you go back, please? Thank you. At the same time, so Cooper came from the East Coast at the same time in that late 1860 period, an American man, but a, an angler named Frank Kimball was advised by his doctor to go live further south where it was warmer. He had something wrong with his lungs, most likely tuberculosis. That was the thing in those days. So he went down to San Diego and he bought um, the old Rancho Nacional and had the same idea as Cooper. They didn't know each other, but this was just amazing serendipity. They both thought the olive was becoming interesting. The olive oil was beginning to have a market. They thought how splendid if we could grow olive trees on a very large scale as a commercial venture. And both did the same thing. They both raided the local mission. So Cooper raided Mission Santa Barbara, which was the nearest one to him, and Kimball raided a Mission San Diego, and they took many, many workmen. They cut thousands of slips, little, um, little uh, seons from the old olive trees, and they laid them in the ground, and they watered them, and they grew olive orchards. So those old trees which had come from Spain through Mexico are now being put to modern use. This 1868 is really the beginning of modern olive culture in California. The whole story of California's agriculture is gripping, but we haven't got time really to go into it, unfortunately, this evening. And remember that the next year, in 1869, the railway was completed. They drove the Golden Spike in Utah, and you could now go by train from the East Coast to the West Coast. This too had a giant effect on the crops and the produce that California was beginning to create. So we have Cooper and we have Kimball. Now Cooper was a man of considerable substance and education, and he understood the value of institutions in taking things forward. He served in the, um, in the um, house in, in Sacramento. He introduced the idea of having a state horticultural board, a state agricultural board. He was a very important figure in getting things on a very sound footing. So um, we take our hats off to Elwood Cooper. Now the next slide, I think you the next slide, Tom. Thank you, I'm afraid it got out of order. I said that Bidwell grew olive trees, he made olive oil, and this is a bottle of olive, an empty bottle from his ranch with the term Bidwell olive oil. And you will be interested to know that there is a group of people, a community of people whose hobby is collecting olive oil bottles. They have meets where they swap the bottles, California olive oil bottles. And this is the prize rarity, a complete one with the labor intact from Bidwell. I had the devil of a time to persuade its owner to let me have a photograph. He was very, very protective and possessive of his prize. Next one, please. This is a photograph by Ansel Adams. You may or may not remember, but in 1968, which was 100 years since the University of California was founded, Clark Kerr invited Adams to travel around the then campuses, photograph whatever he wanted to do to record the universities 100 years later. And Adams decided to include this. It's an avenue of very, very old olive trees, long predating the university. Winters is a small town just outside Davis, and it's extremely important for agriculture in general and for the olive tree in particular. It is the seat of one of the USDA's germplasm repositories. These are places, gigantic orchards really, where a sample or a specimen of every fruit and crop tree 
ever brought into this state is growing under very carefully controlled conditions. So that in the event something wipes out a whole race of trees, it can be replanted. The same is done, of course, for the major food crops like wheat and, and corn and rice. There's a, a bunker in Norway under the polar ice cap, I believe, where they keep those seeds. So this is a beautiful painting, a picture of very old olive trees near Davis. Next slide, please. As I said, they started nurseries. These are pictures from old catalogs. This shows you what a healthy olive sapling should look like in its container. And the next one, I think, is a beautiful line drawing also from another catalog showing the outline of the tree with the olives. Can we move on? This just shows a graft. Next one, please. Here's another star figure who was important, Eugene Hilgard. He was the first Dean of Agriculture and Professor of Agriculture in the new university when it opened in 1868. As most of you know, it was a combined university. It was a land grant college under the, uh, what's the Ashley Morrill uh, Law in 1862. Plus it was a privately endowed liberal arts college. In order to get the agricultural school going, the the um, regents showed extraordinary vision. They reached out to this man who was at the time in Wisconsin. His father had immigrated from, from Germany in the 1848, fleeing the great revolutions, the red revolutions. His father was, was an academic, His son was an even more gifted academic, but he threw up all the comforts of home and came out to live in Berkeley. They built him a beautiful house, which you can still see, and they named a street for him, Hillgard Avenue. And most of you, I think, probably traveled on Hillgard. He paid a great deal of attention to all the people in his community. He wasn't just a professor for the classes. He left campus and traveled widely. And he knew a great deal about hands-on culture. So he was very important in the story of the olive tree once he got to California. Next, please. This is the original. Berkeley building, the chemistry building in Berkeley, a few years after the school opened. Doesn't look like too much to us now, but it was important because it was there that the chemists, I think there are pictures of them. Next slide. Yeah, Violetti, next one. Haney, whose family helped to found the town of Ojai. And the final one, George Colby, whose great granddaughter I met socially and who scolded me for something I'd written about him that wasn't true. Uh, anyway, they, they were very gifted chemists and using very simple old fashioned methods, they established the fine points of the composition of pure olive oil. And that was very, very important because we haven't yet said much about adulteration, but it goes back probably to the Phoenicians it was expensive to produce. If you could stretch it by some means, you could make more money. And so knowing what a perfect sample of olive oil should contain allowed you then to measure anything you were suspicious of against that standard. So next one, please. Dean Wixon followed Hilgard. There was somebody in between who was not that not, you know, important, didn't do such a great job. But Dean Wixon was another seminal figure he, he expanded the university agricultural department and was very, very active in forwarding many of the crops that the university uh, supported. I will say now another piece of interesting trivia. During that phase of the university in, in, into the 1900s and, and the early 20th century, the faculty had no sort of pension plan they were uh, on their own once they retired. So as the olive gained in popularity, and I would say that the period from about 1880 to 1920 was its heyday, was its peak, the time when you thought you could really make some money and do things with it. A group of those faculty members got together and they bought themselves an olive orchard in the foothills to have an income after they retired. Next slide, please. I imagine many of you have been through the town of Corning, which is way up on Route 5 in the upper Sacramento Valley. And you may or may not remember that the sign that greets you says Olive Capital of California. 
Well, that's questionable. But that's all because of one man, Warren Woodson. He was a very astute realtor. He bought a lot of property and he wanted to sell it in 10 acre lots. The railroad was now bringing people, the railroads were very interested in people buying tickets. And so they helped support various endeavors at the various stops at the other end of the line. So he knew there was a flow of people coming from the East Coast, but he had another idea. In order to make the offer sweeter, he planted each of those lots with little orchards. He wasn't in any way a horticulturist, or he didn't understand what he was doing. He just ran down to the local nursery and said to the nursery man, give me you know, job lots of this number of trees for my, this number of um, plots to, or, to fill out and we'll get them going. So he advertised in the church newspapers. He was very religious and he knew that people who read something in a church newspaper would believe it, it would be true. And for people to come and buy his land. Meanwhile, time is going by. Pear trees and peach trees and apple trees do not do well with neglect, don't function with neglect. The olive trees were very happy. So finally, when he did sell his land, what people found were olive orchards. And even more interesting, they were a particularly unusual kind of olive. They put out very much larger olives than the ones which had hitherto been used in the state. So that's why Woodson is an interesting figure. And the main street of Corning is full of shops selling olive related goods. Next one, please. Here's a major nursery, George Rudding, whose father uh, Frederick had made a fortune in Germany and came to California, made another fortune as a banker, was also very interested in, in plants and decided to found a nursery down in the southern part of the San Juan near Fresno. Um, there's a terrible typo, I'm sorry. It was not in 1909, but 1909. Uh, and he, George, his son George, was a gifted horticulturist, a brilliant businessman, and an indefatigable, indefatigable worker. And he featured the olive tree as the cover of his 1909 catalog. That tells you something about the importance Usually people put roses or, you know, uh, zinnias or something, you know, cherry blossom. It shows you that the, this was at the peak of the olive wave. Almost not quite a bubble that lasted a bit too long, but certainly a wave. So there's a beautiful, that's in the library up at Davis. Next one, please. Here's his actual catalog and it includes the numbers of olive trees. He says fruit and shade trees. Next one, please. And then he wrote a very, very useful guide for the people who bought his trees, how they could best be brought up. So Reading was a major figure and there's a huge archive in his place and at Fresno State in the special collections, there are many, many wonderful things related to all this. I did some interesting research in Fresno. Next one, please. This wasn't just in the Southern parts of the town, Napa, a well-known nursery in Napa, indicated that he had trees of all sorts. Next one, please. Calkins was a very significant guy. He was down in Pomona. And the olive trees at the bottom, if you read at the very bottom, olive trees, a specialty, French, Italian, and Spanish varieties. I'm sort of running out of time. How much more time do I have, Annette? Just keep going. Okay, you'll tell me when to stop. Good, that's all good. Right. I, I get wound up. Uh, the olive, as we said earlier, the olive trees they were growing were from the missions. And that was all one Spanish tree. Well, what was it? Well, for simplicity's sake, they called it the Mission Olive. It's not his real name. In the, about 1898, some scholars sent samples back to Spanish authorities and asked them, what is this tree? And, they, and uh, it came from around uh, Seville, as we said, and it was known as Cornicabra which is a bit of a mouthful. So we still call it the mission tree. Somewhere in the early 1870s, a cellar master for the Dreyfus um, vineyards was sent to Spain to bring back other kinds of vines, but also 
to look for new kinds of olive trees. And he sent back the uh, uh, samples of two kinds of olive, which are very, very important. One was the manzanilla, and the other was the sevillana. Both of them big fruit, which meant that when they finally worked out how to eat the fruit and use it, those were the best trees for that purpose. So you now have three kinds of olive trees. And here, and this is in about 1890, Calkin, I'm sorry, Luther Burbank and Calkins were even getting spent French and Italian trees. A side issue of this reliance on one tree is very important. The trees came from Spain through Mexico to the missions. They were on their own. There was nothing else that ever got near them. They suffered from minor blights that all trees get and so on, doesn't, they don't really matter. The killer blight, the pest that is ruining olive orchards all over the world and has for the last 40 or 30 or 40 years is known as the Dacus fly. It's a very, very bad natured fly. It lays its eggs in the olive blossom. So instead of an olive, you get a bunch of fly eggs. Nothing to be done. You cannot get rid of it. You absolutely cannot. And it's devastated a lot of orchards. This did not hit California until quite recently. It was widespread all over Europe. But because the mission, the Mandanilla and the Sevillano trees came from Spain, they did not bring with them the, the seed, whatever it is, the unlager of the Dacus fly. It was only after things got fancy, after about 1970 or so, they got big ideas, you know, plain old mission oil was no longer interesting. And they started importing trees from Italy. And unfortunately, Italy is the epicenter of the Dacus fly. Okay, so that's enough on that subject. It was very important, of course. Next slide, please. Here's a price list. Next one, please. He too wrote a guide, and again, very well written. I've read it, it's in the library, Academy of Sciences, yes. Next one, please. This was an old place near Los Angeles, just north of Los Angeles, better move on a little bit. Next one. Santa Rosa, well, we know who that was. Old Luther himself. He wasn't not really very interested in the olive trees, but he knew he had to stock them because the public wanted them. Next one, please. This was a man in San Francisco. There were a lot in the 19th century, there were a lot of marvelous nurseries in San Francisco, uh, places which are now, of course, all built up. That whole block of fourth, between third and fourth streets um, along Mission was a nursery, was a one gigantic nursery, and that's now where the Society of California Pioneers resides. I thought that was a very fitting place for them to build their uh, office space. Next one, please. Now, okay, we'll come to a, the next part of this talk. I said earlier that the oil was the thing that drove everything. It was used for eating, it was used for cooking, it was used for um, religious purposes. It could be rubbed on the skin to soften the skin. And even when it was rancid and, and at the end of its rope, it was still useful because it burned better. There is always oil, there is always water. When you crush an olive fruit, you're gonna get a lot of water. And later on, I'll show you a flow chart. So even with the best of efforts, there's always some water. But when the oil gets rancid, and the oleic acid takes over, the water goes. And that's the best kind for burning. It is said that ancient Rome smelled of olive oil and cabbage. There's your olive oil burning. But the people were also pickling the olives and eating them all throughout this. It was just all very informal. A small community would go to the mission and pick olives for what it needed. There were not, not much in the way of, of commerce. Um, no one ever eats a second raw olive. The first raw olive is enough. It's full of bitter amygdalins. It's horrible. And that really is another question which has fascinated me for years is how it was that our ancestors 
somehow always picked on very complicated, difficult things to eat. Whatever they did required many processes before it was edible. Anyhow, somewhere, and it's not absolutely not known who, where, or when, had found out that if you soaked olives in water for a very long time, the bitterness left, and they were quite nice to eat. So people had always been eating olives to some extent. Getting the oil out of them was a no-brainer. I mean, you squashed it and your fingers felt greasy, the oil. But deciding how and when to eat it was a whole other story, in my opinion. This lady was born in Germany, married to a physician and lived in Michigan. But when he died, her son, who was a commercial salesman, in those days they called them a drummer, who go around drumming up business, uh, thought that he could take her inheritance and increase it by investment. And of course, he had only the best intentions, but the result was a disaster. He lost all her money. She had one asset left that survived this, um, this flood, and that was an olive orchard in the foothills near Chico. She was a very strong woman, a very strong moral fiber, big, very bright in her ways, and she wanted to repay her debts. Her asset was an olive orchard. She would deal with olives. So she did. First, she went to my friend Hilgard, who I showed you earlier. She lived with her, she was a widow, so she came to California, lived with her son, who was based in Berkeley, and her daughter-in-law, and took her olives to Hilgard and asked for his help. What should she do with them to make them taste good? And he told her this very simple method I mentioned earlier, lots and lots and lots of water. So, she had her buckets of olives out on the back porch of the house. The only running water was in the front of the house. She therefore picked up buckets of water three, four, five times a day and once in the night to go and change the water and her olives. And she did that for a couple of months and she took the results back to Hilgard and Hilgard said, you've done well, these are good. You can, you can make these now. So she went to her orchard, she got the olives picked, she put them through this process and she began marketing it herself. And I know this because I had the enormous privilege of meeting two of her great granddaughters, absolutely charming women. And here she was, she worked like a, you know, a slave literally to do this. And her olives, her company prospered, she put her son in charge of the business side of it they would put the olives into jars and then they would sell them. And everything was going very well. Olives, edible olives, table olives were catching on. If you've ever read Booth Tarkington's The Magnificent Amazons, which was a remarkable book in this, or in this study of a man that just never quite caught on to what life was happening, what was happening around him. One of the characters mentions olives in it, he says, my wife just keeps getting into all these new knickknacks and foul mouths. He said, take these olives. Don't, take like, don't taste like nothing much to me, more like a sour plum. Anyhow, they were becoming very fashionable and she was selling very, very well. Can we have the next slide? Here shows the rather primitive ways they had of picking the olives. That was what was going on in her orchard. Very dangerous work, as you can imagine. Next slide, please. Once they were picked, if they were to be table olives, they had to be sorted for size. You could write another book on the history of sizing the olives. Unbelievable cabals and, and uh, back and forth amongst the experts. Next one, please. Here are these poor ladies sorting them and see how large the supply of olives was. Next one, please. This is a very interesting man. We'll come back to him in a little while. Next one, please. And he too is a little bit later in my story. Next one. Mrs. Emmon olives were selling very well and it became the mark of, of, of real, uh, being a very good hostess of hospitality to offer them to your guests. And in Kolinga, which is a small town south of Fresno on 99 near Visalia, 
in the year 1921, a lady, um, I got the wrong date. I read the report in 19, it happened earlier in 19, whatever it was. But then she gave a party at her golf club for, to celebrate some event. And not only did she have the party catered by the club's kitchen, but she offered additionally um, little sauces of olives on each table. Well, the waiter opened a jar of olives and he didn't really like the smell. He tasted it and it didn't taste right to him. So he went into the kitchen and he said, chef, I don't like the look of this. What do you think? And the chef ate one. And a few hours later, they were both dead. This was an outbreak of botulism, which were conveyed by the olives, all unknown, of course, to poor Mrs. Emmon. And we have to do a little bit of chemistry. And um, we can go back to uh, Dr. Cruz, if we can go back one or two slides. Here we go. Much earlier workers, he was born toward the middle of the 20th century, but workers before him got very busy and established, A, they cultured these olives and found they grew the botulism. And then they did a lot of research and found that the um, fluid in which the um, olives were put up was alkaline. Botulinum, botulus toxin, the bacteria of botulinus thrives in an alkaline environment. If you have an acid environment, it dies. And here were these jar upon jar of alkaline fluid olives traveling around the country. For 10 years after that episode, the olive industry crashed. Uh, it took enormous amounts of work by several you know, significant scholars and chemists to begin reassuring the public that things were all right. They discovered that if you heated the olives and the put them in a can rather than a jar and heated them to 240 degrees Fahrenheit, you killed off any botulinum spore that was lurking in there. So olives began to be put up in cans. You couldn't, you couldn't sterilize a glass jar to that temperature. So that was the story for the table olive. Olive oil was kind of always in the background. There were a lot of Italian and other Mediterranean people migrating into California who liked uh, and used olive oil. The Northern Europeans, the Germans, the Swedes, the English, olive oil was a foreign substance. They had no interest in it, but a lot of Italian people were coming in and they were doing what the other earlier settlers had done, going to the mission orchards and um, collecting fruit, making their own oil. So olive oil was always in the background. It was always considered to be a sort of a, a, a stepchild in a way. Quite fascinating to us nowadays because nowadays our interest for uh, culinary and other spiritual reasons is in the oil. The table olive really in my mind should be the stepchild. But anyway, that's how it played out in the early parts of the 20th century. Dr. Cruz, was a great expert in food science and such things as the best way to pre prepare and can and protect, preserve things. They built a building for him in, in Davis, which has his name on it, an extraordinary man. Can we go to the next slide? There's our table of our poor old botulina sufferers. There were two or three more outbreaks before all the research was finished. The, this, I found this map or this uh, topographical diagram in the, in the Journal of the Public Health Association. It was written up some years later uh, in the public health literature because the public health doctors played a very important role in tracing what happened. Let's see the next one. Now, here we're going back again. These are the cans going into the sterilizers. Next one. I love this picture. It was in the library of that USDA center in um, Winters near Davis, they wanted to have pitted olives. And this was an early attempt to pit olives. I think Rube Goldberg would probably be quite proud of that machine. Next slide. 
Here's what I was telling you about it. When you crush an olive and press it, the final product is olive oil, okay, but an awful lot of water. So it's a big deal to get rid of the water and there are various ways of doing that. Next slide, please. Here's an early olive oil factory in, Cal in Los Angeles. And you notice these women sitting there putting labels on the jars. I think there's another picture like that. Next one, um, Tom. Yes. The great movie director Frank Capra's parents were indescribably poor Italian immigrants. And in order to make a living, Capra's mother worked for $5 a week in a place like this, sticking labels onto jars. Next one, please. Here's an exquisitely interesting figure. Charles Gifford, a one-off, as they say, uh, in San Diego. He had an olive oil factory and he made table olives and he had a wagon and his team of horses and he would drive through San Diego offering his wares for sale. A fascinating figure. I just included him for a little human interest after all these serious facts and figures. Is there anything else? Okay. I've more or less come to the end of my part of the talk. I just want to tell one more anecdote and then we will talk about this slide. As I said, olive oil languished very badly. In the 1930s, uh, Sicilian immigrants in Modesto had olive orchards and citrus orchards. And the patriarch, um, uh, Joe, Joseph Shapika, decided he wanted to have a wider audience to sell his olive oil. It was very, very difficult to sell it. And he knew there were communities of similar Sicilian immigrants in Philadelphia. So in 1936, he began the cycle of taking a train in the spring to Philadelphia and taking down orders and go home and then back again in the late winter because olives are a winter crop. He would return to Philadelphia and fulfill the orders. That was how you made a living back then, selling olive oil. He, I met him, amazing, wonderful man. I met his children, his sons and his granddaughters. His, um, his daughters-in-law, they gave me one of those fabulous Italian lunches when I visited them. Just as I said at the very beginning, the experience of doing this research was the really great reward. Now we come to Saratoga. And you can see, you can read it for yourselves, Don Jose Ramon Arguello planted, planted an olive orchard in 1865. He got those seeds from Mission Santa Clara. Just by the way, Planting seeds is a bit of a gamble. You don't quite know what tree will come up, but evidently that's what he did. Whereas if you put in um, clones, you know, like a piece of the old tree, you'll be sure of getting the same variety again. There are, there is one olive, Olea europea lineus is the sole species. There are maybe five, six, seven hundred names on different varieties that grew up in isolated communities all around the Mediterranean. There is considerable evidence that the same tree might have six names in six different villages surrounding that one, or that six different trees in six different villages might have the same name. Nobody can make much sense of it. It's an impossibly difficult task. But we know that these were mission olives, no question about it. There's somebody called Serena Gruden. And then 10 years later, Goodrich, who was from the East Coast, bought the, uh, bought the branch. And then he planted grapevines because as I've been implying all along, but haven't come out categorically and said, the olive and the grape grow off the same kind of soil. They're fine companions for each other. And to this day, I haven't touched on modern California olive oil because there isn't time. Many of the olive, many of the vineyards have olive orchards and sell olive oil as well as wine. So there you have it. I've chatted an awful lot, but I think I'll stop. Oh, wonderful presentation. Are you, we have a few questions. I'll try. So let me see if I can pull them up. Uh, 
This one says, I know you have written about geraniums, flower breeders, California gardens, and ornamental plants. Can you speak about why the olive tree caught your eye first? Perhaps it wasn't your first book. It was my first book. I think that's from Fran. It's a, it's, it was my first book. And as I said, way at the beginning, based on my planting and growing the trees, that was what started me. But it taught me, writing that book taught me a very important truth. You cannot write just one book, just as you cannot eat one potato chip. As soon as you finish that book, your mind is full of ideas. And it happened in my case that I'd been, you know, fostering around in the archives up at Davis in the special collections. And the, the librarian brought me this wonderful box, which had some papers that I was interested in. But at the bottom of this box was a manuscript about California gardens. So that's what got my juices flowing next. That's the story of that. Uh, another question. Could you repeat the author and book you like about history of Mexico? Oh, yes. Fanny Barker de Calderon. It's called Life in Mexico. She wrote wonderful long letters to her sister in Boston. And her sister took them over to Houghton Mifflin and they published it as a book. It makes enchanting reading. Life in Mexico. And um, um, the last question was, where can you obtain the recording of this presentation? And actually it will be on the um, Saratoga History website, which is www.saratogahistory.com. So I wanna thank you, Judith, for a fabulous, fabulous presentation. Made me hungry for olives. I think I might go open a can right now. Okay, it was a so great everybody, everybody will join us again for our presentation in um, fall and then also in May. So be sure and go up to our website to see these, these um, how to log into the presentation. So again, thank you very, very much, Judith. My pleasure.